<laughs> Good evening. I'm Margaret Brennan. I'm the foreign affairs correspondent at CBS News, and with me is a formidable panel uh, of women here who are going to share some of their experience and their stories. Let me introduce to you, near to me, Manisha Nadiri, an extremely brave and determined activist who has come to the aid of many Afghan women who've been victims of rape, acid attacks, child marriage, and domestic violence. Next to her, after spending nearly a decade on the ground in Afghanistan, Sarah Chase is now with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And Gail zamak Leman is a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, also having spent a lot of time reporting and writing about Afghanistan. And I think it is only fitting to start with what is unfortunately news of the day, a story that broke a few hours ago, an update in the case of an Afghan girl named Farkunda. She was beaten to death by a mob after being falsely accused of burning the Quran. Now, the Afghan Supreme Court vacated the death sentences today of the four lead men who were convicted in her case. Others had their sentence reduced. Now, the brutality of what happened to her gained international attention, and the convictions had been seen as a case of rare justice for women. Uh, today, First Lady Rulagani expressed her own disappointment at what happened in the court. So I want to start there to get a read on just where we are, Gail. You've covered this story. Is this an outlier, or is this case symbolic? of what's happening right now. Yeah, I think it's uh, symbolic in uh, both the positive and obviously the incredibly negative, right? Uh, on the negative side, we'll start there, right? The justice system has shown uh, that justice is elusive for many Afghans and especially women. As, you know, uh, Manisha and I, we did way back uh, in 2009 for Tina, the first story on Bibi Aisha, the young woman who was maimed uh, by the Taliban uh, back then. So look, justice has been elusive for or Afghan women for a long time on and today is another setback on the other hand the Farhunda case showed the first time that social media really brought young people especially young women to the streets and onto social media and really pushing for um, an acknowledgement of just how catastrophic that killing was and of just how unjust her murder was and I think you have in that case what is both uh, the sign of hope for a new Afghanistan, which is a young generation fighting for justice, taking to the streets, talking about how this next generation is going to be different, and on the other hand, a justice system that is still uh, struggling to actually offer real justice to Afghans. Manisa, you spend so much time and so much of your life dealing with victims. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of this case? Well, I'm very disappointed. Uh, um, on the decision. I was hoping that these men were, were going to be set on as an example. You know, we wanted them to be fun punished to the fullest extent of the law because what they did, they did out in the media. They had their pictures taken, their videos taken, murdering, hitting, you know, burning this young woman. And they put it on, the social, on social media proudly saying, we did this and we did this in the name of Islam, we did it for Allah. And ye yes, it did bring young women, but also young men out. There was outrage all over the country, not just in the country, but also around the world. Afghans really were outraged. There were um, de demonstrations all over the country demanding justice. So I, you know, I'm rep I'm here, but I'm representing, I think, the whole of Afghanistan, saying how disappointed we are in this uh, turn of events. And there was a vigil here in Washington, too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. which a lot of Afghans who were visiting with Ashraf Ghani at the time actually attended a year yeah. ago. Sarah, I mean, for you, having spent so much time in Afghanistan, you hear often that there's been so much progress and quick progress in mm -hmm. 15 years' time. Is this story symptomatic of the fragility of that? Is it proof that that's not actually the case, that progress has been made? What does it tell you? I mean, there's no denying that there, there have been elements of progress in the country, but fundamentally and overall, I mean, I arrived in Kandahar, Afghanistan, which had been the, the Taliban heartland in December of 2001, and this was a city that was done with the Taliban. Believe me, they, you know, I mean, people weren't throwing their hats up in the air because it was Ramadan and it was, you know, but but they had experienced it and they were finished with it. And here we are, you know, 15 years later, and you've got 
you know, a significant portion of the country that is basically welcoming and permeable to the Taliban. So then the question is why? And I think in this country we have a tendency to see the Taliban as the bad guys. And what we underestimate is how abusive and extortionate the government of Afghanistan has been. And so what I've experienced living you know, among ordinary Afghans the, you know, all those years was everyone I experienced was caught in the crossfire, right? It was, you know, police were shaking them down, judges were viable. Uh, I know someone whose father was blown up in a remotely, you know, whatever, remotely controlled explosive device who had to pay a bribe to get the death certificate for his father, right? And so people are being shaken down and not politely by the very people they expect to be upholding, uh, upholding the law and defending them. So when they are confronted with the, you know, the Taliban entering their village or whatever, it's like, hey, I'm not going to take a risk on behalf of this hostile force mm -hmm. in order to fight against that hostile force. And so people are are just at a loss as to where to, you know, which force is, you know, where, how to preserve their own daily lives. And then unfortunately what happens in situations like that is the argument made by uh, extremist groups like the Taliban in Afghanistan, but also elsewhere like ISIS or Boko Haram in Nigeria is the reason your government is so abusive to you and corrupt in all senses of the word corrupt is because they don't obey law uh, sorry is because they don't obey god and if only our government were organized according to god's law this kind of thing wouldn't be happening and so that's where you get stories like of that young woman that you just saw. Well, and now you do have laws that have enshrined rape as a crime, and you do have a constitution enshrining women's rights and all the rest. Are you saying this is just on paper? It's not reality? Largely. Right? I mean, <laughs> I mean he's just uh, I mean, it's, looking at this every it's day. definitely on paper, but we have to understand. I mean, yes, there are terrible ha things happening in Afghanistan, but we can't unsee the progress that has happened. Fifteen years ago, Afghanistan was a desert. It had no justice system, no mm -hmm. education system. You know, the Taliban had just been overthrown. We have everything now. I mean, they're not great, um, I have to be honest, but there's an education system. Millions of girls are in school. We have a justice system that's, you know, that's struggling, but it's a new justice system. Uh, you know, anything new? How was the United States after the Civil War or after the Revolutionary mm -hmm. War? We can't expect Afghanistan to be the United States, you know. It's, it's struggling, yes. It's been 14 years, 15 years. And I, I really think that if the Taliban don't come back, if peace prevails in Afghanistan, things will get better. Afga Afghans will learn how to, how to do this de democracy. They're ready for democracy. You know, a year and a half to ago, a year and a half ago, years ago, um, millions of Afghans came out and voted in the elections. Mm -hmm. That was, it was such an emotional time for everyone, because old, young, educated, uneducated, you know, in the rural areas, people came out on donkeys. You know, I, I, I've I've heard stories of. Um, a woman who had just given birth, she was on a donkey riding for several hours just to go and, and vote. We have, there, there, there was a man who had, in, in the previous elections, had his fingers cut off and he came out and voted again because he wanted to make a statement. He wanted to make say that the Taliban are not, not going to win, we, we are going to elect our own government. That, that, that really has to be respected. <laughs> when it comes to the question of women, though, um, and their status, why do you think women's groups like yours, shelters like yours, say what happened in Kunduz earlier this year, why is the Taliban targeting those type of shelters when they're retaking or attempting to retake cities? The Taliban have always been against women. That's not a secret. Um, and in Kunduz, when they came, we had gotten threats from the Taliban you know, two years before they actually came and took over the city, demanding that we close down our facilities, you know, they had threatened our province managers, our lawyers, and caseworkers, um, telling them to stop working and that they were going to be punished. And then when they came, we knew that they were, they were going to come and kill our staff because we had seen the signs. So um, 
as soon as they came, our province manager, uh, you know, saw saw that you know they had come, and they, she um, thought really fast and got all of our um, staff. We have 74 staff members in Kunduz. We had and you snuck them out we so that they would yes, evade we the s- Taliban. Snuck them out under burqas. We had women in our shelters. We have we had children in our ch- children support centers. So we're talking about you know a couple of hundred people that we had to sneak out under burqas. You know, in the, in the dead of night, they had to walk to staff members' houses because we knew that they, our facilities were no. We knew, we knew that they were going to come and target us. So uh, the next morning, when they crossed the border from one province to the next province, our province manager got a call saying, "You know, where are you? Where are the women?" And she said, "Well, they're in Kabul." And they're like, "Well, you, it's a good thing you got you got away." They were still in Kunduz on their way out, but. Um, and then the next thing we knew, they came and took over our facilities. They looted our uh, buildings and they found the shelter. Um, they stayed in the shelter for a couple of nights, and then when they were leaving, they burned it down to the ground. Gail, when this was just a few months ago, okay. and it was uh, this kind of resurgence that led into the decision making with the White House to say maybe we'll slow down this drawdown um, and keep U.S. forces there. I mean, is it possible then? to even begin talking about having negotiations, peace talks with the Taliban, if they're still doing this? Well, the first question is, which Taliban and who's speaking for them? I mean, the Taliban has never been um, the monolith that I think from the outside, or certainly from Washington, uh, we wanted it, it to look like. And, and then yeah. the second question is, you know, who is that going to actually care about what happens to women? Right, because everybody talked about women's rights on the way into Afghanistan, and very few people want to talk about them. Well, on it's the in way the out. Constitution. It's supposed Correct. to be non-negotiable. President Ghani right. said that. Is it? It depends on how badly the international community wants out, doesn't it? You know, I mean, that has always been when you watch it up close. There, that's why you see Laura Bush was writing in the Washington Post today. She has a book coming out. Secretary Clinton has spoken at length. Ambassador Revere has spoken at length. And yet, there's no question that the issue of what happens to women has always been seen as peripheral rather than central to the conversation. Um, a lot of people have talked about it, but when you look at actual policy, I think there is a gap between my aunt's Mexican, and there's a phrase in uh, Spanish that's from the word to the deed, much is lost. Mm. And I think that there is uh, something to be said for that here because um, it has always been amazing that half the population could be seen as a special interest group, mathematically. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yet, that has really largely remained the reality. And Afghanistan is not an isolated case. So I, I do think that women over the years have told me, I mean, from 2005 on, that they were in favor of... Taliban negotiations, particularly Afghan Taliban, um, because they said our brothers are part of this country. But what they didn't want to negotiate was whether they could go to school and go to work. Mm-hmm. And I think those uh, those two are the questions. So do I you think see there's it yeah, and there's another issue here. And and just having I, I watched the issue of negotiations with the Taliban start to gain traction in about two, 2008 yeah. is when it started to emerge. And my question was why. Again, back to what I said before, you've got two institutions that are anathema to most of the population of Afghanistan, and that's the Afghan government, and it's the Taliban, right? And so the notion was, we're going to have a two-sided negotiation between a corrupt government and a, and a sadistic extremist force. And my question was, what about all the people? And so that goes back to what mm-hmm. you said. Yes, there was a huge demand for democracy. There's always been a huge demand for democracy in Afghanistan, but the supply has been lacking. So people went out to vote, and then both of the candidates forged their votes, just like President Karzai forged votes in 2009. And then what happens? The United States says, oh, okay, we're going to do a bicephalous, you know, kind of executive here. So you just mentioned the Afghan constitution, Mm -hmm. and that was always like on the Taliban, it was always they can negotiate if they accept the Afghan constitution, but then what do we do? We create an office. A power sharing right. mechanism. Right, a CEO. Where is that in the Afghan constitution, right? And so what are Afghans supposed to think when the Americans, who are supposed to be the sort of harbingers, the, the protectors of law and order and constitutional, um, I even set aside the word democracy, it, 
you know, my Afghan friends have been really confused about what, what is America all about here if we've been supporting a government that's blatantly corrupt, if we allow people to come to power after forging thousands of votes, and then we create a sort of egg, egg whatever, a, 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 an invented office that's not in the Constitution. It, this is where I've experienced a real disconnect between how Americans see our involvement in Afghanistan and how at least my Afghan friends have experienced it. We say we're trying to bring Western democracy to these people who just don't really know much about democracy. Mm -hmm. And I agree 100% with you that like the Afghans were demanding democracy and they're saying, you Americans, what did you bring us? Cronyism, corruption, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a little complicated, this narrative. Yeah. The administration would say, oh, well, we helped to usher in a peaceful transition of power right, uh, from one government to the next. Mendeza, when you look at the grassroots and you, you hear um, these stories from, from Gail and from Sarah there, what are you seeing in, on the ground? Because on paper, you do have this constitution, and on paper you also have more women in senior positions. You've got four female ministers. There were attempts to you know, really elevate women uh, at the senior level. What's happening at the grassroots? At the grassroots, there are women involved, you know, in, 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 in the education system. There are women involved in the community councils. Um, they should be more involved because you know women make over 50% of the population, so there should be more than 50% involvement. About negotiations with the Taliban, I have to say that I'm, I'm and you know, my, we have over um, 700 staff members on, uh, in Afghanistan. We're all against negotiations with the Taliban really? because the Taliban can't be trusted. Um, a few years ago, there were negotiations in Pakistan with the Taliban who were governing the Swat Valley. And at that time, they said, you know, they signed on paper, we're going to respect the cons constitution of Pakistan. We're going to let girls go to school. As soon as those, the, the, the paper was signed, they made girls stay in school. Uh, I mean, Malala's from there. Mm -hmm. She was shot, uh, shot down. Um, but this is, it's worth pointing out that that's a very heart of the administration policy in this country, and it's also at the heart of the Afghan government's strategy. Yes, I think it's, it's a mistake. forging peace. Do you see it, as they've described, that it's really a trade-off between military drawdown and women's rights? It is, yeah. It's that simple yeah. for you? I th yes. I, I don't think there should be any negotiations with those barbarians or terrorists who kill civilians on a daily basis. Whenever there's talk about negotiations with them, we see more suicide bombings on the streets of Kabul and other provinces. And it's time to say we're not going to uh, support terrorists, we're not going to negotiate with terrorists. The Afghan government needs to create jobs for people. I think economics has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. We have over 40% unemployment in the country. And we have, you know, our, the, the, Afghanistan is a very young nation. We have young men who are graduating out of um, high school, but there's no place for them to go to university. There are not, no jobs for them. What are they supposed to do? Just wait around on the corner of the, you know, s sidewalk? The, the, you know, the people joining the, the Taliban are not. I really don't think they're joining because they so believe in the, in the Tal Taliban. They, they're doing it for economics. I mean, mm -hmm. the ta will and justice. I mean, again, the, they're unemployed, and then meanwhile, government officials are driving around. You know, you've seen the vehicles, right? <laughs> you know, so there's a justice element too. I think. But Sarah, would you comment though directly on this question of really the point Gail made of drawdown and what's at risk, because you had right. previously right. supported the withdrawal of U.S. forces. I still do, and I do because I don't think this is a military question. And I think the argument, for example, in Iraq, which says Iraq, you know, kind of a third of Iraq fell to ISIS because U.S. troops were drawn down, I don't think that's accurate. The real issue was there were U.S. officials in Baghdad who were sitting on Maliki's head at the time, Prime Minister Maliki's head, preventing him from really wiring up his kleptocratic network on, you know, to benefit his, his little, little cronies. And so I actually think the issue here is not a military issue. I mean, look at, look at Iraq and look at Afghanistan after 15 years. If our troops have not been able to hold the line on this, it's because the issue is not one that can be solved militarily. So what I would say is what we need in Afghanistan is not more 
troops or for troops to stay, but is a really serious multi-stakeholder peace process, not Taliban Afghan government peace process, but multi-stakeholder community leaders. What is going wrong with the way this government is functioning? That's what I think would be needed. And Mindisa, I want you to talk about because you are in the communities yeah. um, and you are working uh, in to, to really help provide social services to many of them, including this 10-year-old girl that your organization has been helping for two years now was raped by a mullah in Kunduz um, who was sentenced to 20 years in prison. That was seen as a win. He actually faced a sentence. He did. Are these small hmm. victories? I mean, are... are that, that was a very big vict victory, actually, because the mullah raped the... Well, this is also a case we're looking at here in 2012 of Gulmina, who was attacked mm. uh, for in an honor killing a 10-year-old on that mm. iPad there. I just want to tell people what they're seeing. I mean, it, t talk to me about that. I mean, can, at the community level, you feel that void that you're hearing described? I mean, that, that case about the 10-year-old girl is a big victory because... When the mullah was standing trial, he was actually demanding. He was saying, yes, I'm guilty, I did this. But it was consensual, he was saying. <laughs> uh, he, he was saying, punish me according to Sharia law, which basically meant 100 lashes, and he, w he was going to marry the girl. 10 years old. Yes. But the judge, Afghanistan is an Islamic country. You know, they, they follow Sharia law. The judge at that moment rejected Sharia law and said, I'm not going to do that. She's, the, she's a victim. I'm going to punish you and he got 20 years in prison, and he's still in prison. We go make sure that he's in prison every month. Yeah. <laughs> and with the case of that attempted honor killing, you saw um, Gulmina there brutally attacked. Yeah. How widespread are things like that? You're not talking about the Taliban. You're talking about her family members mm. doing that to her. Yeah, that's very widespread. Um, women represent the honor in, in families, and if they do something that the families think is dishonorable, like um, running away from home to marry somebody you love. Which is what she was, uh, said she had yes, done. Yes, she, she was forced to marry a 60-year-old man and who had two other wives and who was being abused every day, but uh, she ran away with, her, uh, with a young neighbor, and they settled in a, in a province, and then her brother found her, and... Uh, hit her all over her body uh, 21 times with an axe and killed her husband. Um, they're still, I mean, the brother is still not found. We don't know where he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gail and Sarah, would you weigh in here? Because I feel like yeah. these stories break your heart when you hear them. Is it just a litany of tragedy right. here? Well, and I think how that's do you the marry issue. the two ideas you've been with the Afghanistan narrative, right? It's either a basket case or a beacon of hope. And the truth is, it's somewhere in between. It is a series of micro hopes against macro challenge. And I say that lightly, <laughs> macro challenge. But I really mean that because the fact that Manisha has shelters that are not just in Kabul city, right, that are around the country, and that men and women come to her family resource centers, and she's not the only person running shelters along. There are a number of organizations. Hers is the one that I think has the most nationwide. But you really see, I mean, I've been in places where, in fact, I remember interviewing a teacher in Kandahar in four years ago. He really whip-smart 25-year-old who said to me, my biggest challenge is not the Taliban, my biggest challenge is fathers taking their girls out of school to get married. Mm -hmm. And so you had teachers like that who were beacons of hope. I mean, and, and I do think that you have this young generation. It's not a monolith, but there are enough of them around mm -hmm. the country that are connected, that are massively, you know, addicted to their cell phones, on Facebook. You know, they want to be connected to the outside world, and they are allies in the fight for a country whose future looks different than its past. And the question is whether the world will continue to engage with them or whether it will decide, well, you know, we can't do yeah. anything there anymore. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but I want you both to quickly say, how do you battle that apathy and these women being forgotten? You know, my job is to make sure that they're not forgotten. And I do that in Afghanistan with the local government. And you will do that regardless of troop levels, regardless of drawdown. Yes, you will yes. Say. And I do that in, the, in Washington, D.C. to make sure that policy, policymakers don't forget Afghanistan. Afghanistan, Sarah's against, um, you know, troops speak in Afghanistan. But 
being on the ground, we need troops. We still need troops. The Afghan forces are small. They're being trained, but they're not ready to fend off the Taliban or take over the country right now. We still need troops in Afghanistan, and I really hope that you know that the that the administration is going to listen and, and have patience with Afghanistan because Afghanistan didn't become t today's Afghanistan overnight. It took 40, 40 yeah. years of war. We need at least 40 years, if not more, for, for it to get better. Sarah, <laughs> final thought. How do you remind people that they can't forget? Uh, I don't think it's about troops. I really think it's about governance. And I think um, that Afghanistan's story is actually paralleled in a lot of other places that are on the headlines, like parts of Iraq, like Syria, like northern Nigeria, like, in other words, we're, we're dealing with a world where governance has become uh, abusive of its mm -hmm. own people, and that's at the heart of a lot of the problems we're seeing. All right. We could talk about this for hours, but we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, panelists. Thanks to all of you. Thank you.